ബിസ്മില്ലാഹിർ So the verses that we are going to study today are from 23 to 35 of Surah Al-Ma'arij which is the 70th surah just going to read the text and translation before you Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Allazina hum ala salatihim daimun wallazina fi amwalihim haqqun ma'lum lis-sa'ili wal-mahrum but not those who pray who are always vigilant in the prayer who have a fixed portion in their wealth for those who ask and for the deprived So this is the first uh, couple of verses uh, which tell us about uh, the two very important directives which the Quran often gives adjacent the directive of the prayer and the directive to pay zakat to the society's uh, well-being. So the first thing is that allazina hum ala salatihim daimun that they are always vigilant in the prayer uh, they are punctual in their prayer it's not that they start offering prayers uh, and then in a few days they just uh, for, uh, forget them or maybe just uh, slowly they they just tune away but in fact what they do is that they start off in a very punctual way they are vigilant in their prayers and uh, to be vigilant in, in our prayer of course is something that we have to always look after and this can only be uh, really benefited from if we know that the prayer is this biggest connection that we can have through god it's a communion with god it's our conversation with god especially if you view surah fatiha which is made mandatory in every rakat of the prayer you'll find that it is uh, like a conversation with god it seeks his guidance it seeks its help it is the call of a person who is in need uh, in need of guidance and it is a call of a person who acknowledges the the favors of the almighty Uh, a person who acknowledges the favors that he has done the almighty has done to us and he has continued to do so for not only us but for the all, for all people around us without any uh, without any distinction so walladina hum fi amwalihim haqqum ma'lum so these are the people who have a fixed share in their wealth of course referring to the mandatory charity that every muslim is supposed to pay which is zakat and uh, zakat is something that we have been discussing in some of our other sessions as well that it is composed it is imposed on wealth imposed on pr- produce and livestock so the three heads of zakat are wealth produce and livestock wealth on wealth it is levied once a year on the date that you have fixed for your zakat disbursement on produce it is levied on your gross uh, income of whatever things are produced so there could be salaries there could be rent it could be things that you produce through your skills and livestock of, of course again is something that you have to pay on the date of your zakat there is a fixed uh, a portion that you have to give in the uh, way of god uh, keeping in view the camels or the cows or the uh, sheep or goats that you may own so this is something that you can easily find in the books of fiqh but uh, needless to say that these are the three heads of zakat and we have to be as we have been pointing this all along vigilant in paying zakat also try to calculate it as accurately as possible and also we should all uh, understand that zakat on the one hand is a tax which a muslim government can uh, the sole tax which a muslim government can impose on its muslim citizens and on the other hand it's also a worship ritual so it's like a, it has two sides one side is that it is something that you pay to the government so that the government can run the state and the, on the other hand it's an obligation it's uh, of worship that we owe to the almighty and it connects us uh, to our human fraternity walazina yusaddiquna bi yawm ad-din so they are ones who truly believe in the day of reckoning so of course the uh, third attribute which is mentioned here is that believers are those who are fully aware of the fact that they are going to be held accountable on the day of judgment on on the day of judgment if you are, we are held accountable we know that every person has to be vigilant in his or her deeds uh, practices uh, in even even intentions so uh, the accountability in the hereafter is something which the quran is replete with if there is anything that can be called as the topic of the quran it is this accountability of the hereafter uh, about which we are so clearly 
uh, given guidance that look how the last prophet of God created a miniature day of judgment on the face of this earth. And uh, this accountability is now going to take place for all the rest of the people after him. The only thing is that it has been deferred to the day of judgment. For messengers of God, the days of judgment take place in this world. For the rest of the nations, they are deferred. But the fact is that accountability will take place for both these categories. So believers are those who, who testify, who believe in the day of judgment. And they keep dreading the punishment of their Lord. Which means that, of course, on the day of judgment, when they will be held accountable, they would like to see themselves pass through and sail through in flying colors. They would not uh, want themselves to face the ignominious punishment of hell. And it is precisely for this reason they fear the punishment of their Lord. And we know from several other places and instances in the Quran that this punishment is something which is unbearable, which would be unbearable for people and people who should dread this punishment because this is the punishment that we would ourselves acknowledge that yes, uh, as the Quran says, that people who will be sent to hell, uh, they would for themselves confess that yes, they, are, they deserve this punishment. So God wants us to be on guard that we should not end up in hell. So precisely for this reason, these verses state, وَالَّذِينَهُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ And then the next verse also uh, reinforces uh, what is just said. إِنَّ عَذَابَ رَبِّهِمْ غَيْرُ مأمون. Because the punishment of their Lord is not something to be careless about. You just cannot ignore it. The punishment of God is something that is going to cling to people. And it is something that one cannot remain secure. So uh, people do ask that if God is such, uh, I mean, he's such a revengeful God, that why is it that we see that the Quran is also talk, talking about his mercy and affection and compassion and graciousness? So you see, we have to understand that this, uh, uh, this side of God in which he is stern in retribution is a very, very uh, natural consequence of his justice. People who are uh, good people who have behaved themselves have to be rewarded, but people who have flouted their rights uh, um, imposed on them, people who have done all sorts of bad deeds, for example, they have molested children, they have raped women, uh, they have uh, hijacked people on ransom, they have killed people, they have uh, mercilessly massacred people. All these people deserve justice and they have to be brought to justice. So remember, God's justice and God's wrath, basically, is going to befall all these people who deserve uh, to be in such a situation. And it is certainly not against God's mercy. It is fully in accordance with God's mercy and his justice. And then these verses say, so these are the ones who preserve their chastity except with their wives and slave girls for in their matter they are not blameworthy but those who seek to go beyond this then it is they who are transgressors so these verses occur in surah uh, ma'arij that the way we have just seen and also in surah mu'minun uh, which we started some days ago that as far as uh, believers are concerned, they do not indulge in extra marital relations. And this is something which sounds the death knell for the family system. Uh, the Quran has said a family can only be secure, a family can only uh, develop and groom children uh, when it itself is, is uh, totally secure. And this security is offered when their, the spouses do not look outside of their wedlock towards other people. And the exception here, of course, which is mentioned is, are, is the wives. And slave girls have only been mentioned, keeping in view this, the situation of those times in which for a particular transitory period, because slavery was being gradually eliminated. And during that gradual, I mean, during that uh, transient or this, uh, uh, this temporary time, it was given sanction or it was allowed un until it was totally eradicated by the end of the prophet's uh, demise from this world uh, when he passed away. So during this that time, it was uh, being slowly eradicated and therefore people were still allowed. But once it was totally eradicated and the Quran had called people to say that uh, once their slaves asked for their own emancipation and they gave a reasonable 
guarantee to the owner also that it will not be a burden on the society, then every master who owned a slave was bound to set them free. And the only exception would be that people or the slaves who themselves wanted to stay with them because for ages their families were with the masters. But of course, no new slave could be inducted because as we have been discussing this all along, that the source of slavery in those times were wars and people would capture prisoners of war and they were they would turn them into slaves. So the Quran at the very first war which took place between the believers and the disbelievers, the Battle of Badr, at that very instant, the Quran prohibited uh, categorically that no prisoner of war could be made a slave at all. So any induction of new slaves was stopped and, and slaves who were already there, they, they, there was a scheme chalked out by the Quran for their gradual elimination. So once that happened, of course, slavery uh, was no longer uh, I mean, allowed in any way. That is a separate matter that it continued later on, it's resurfaced, and it was uh, until very recently that it was totally abolished. But as far as the Quran is concerned, it did its best. I mean, it did more than its best and, it, and uh, eradicated this uh, inhuman institution. So the stress here is that in order to build a proper family, uh, believers, they do not look outside of wedlock. They don't indulge in any sort of extramarital relations. They are focused on their wives and wives are focused on their husbands because this focus is actually something which guarantees a family in which the spouses are devoted to one another, in which when they come together, close together, they can really groom the next generation with confidence and with full security. So they are those who keep their trusts and not only those who keep their trusts uh, and promises both with regard to God and with regard to their fellow human beings. So who keep their trusts and their promises both with regard to God and with regard to their fellow human beings. So they don't are they are not dishonest in their trust. They, whatever is consigned to them, and the word trust should not be considered in a very narrow way. All things which are uh, which are entrusted to people as a result of covenants, as a result of things that are uh, understood in the norms of a society, including uh, the posts that you are given in a pub as a public officer, including some of the uh, responsibilities that we are given uh, when we uh, when we ass assign for a particular job. These all all of these are included in our trusts. And so when we are entrusted with these responsibilities, the Quran says that they are ones who fulfill their trust and not only their trust, but they also fulfill the promises that they make. So remember promises, they have to be made to be kept. So when we make a promise, when we give our word, we have to be sure that we are, will be able to honor it. And if we are not sure at all, then it is better to not give our word at, in the first place. If we, if we are not sure, because this would, of course, mean that in the very first instance, we are not very sure and we have already given our word for it. So promise in, is something that we have to ab abide by. And I've been also pointing this out in uh, some of our previous sessions that our religion itself is a promise that we have made to God to abide by. So it's called Misak. Misak means a covenant and covenant, of course, is like a promise. So when we enter the folds of Islam, we not only enter the folds, we actually give us this undertaking that in future we will abide by what the Quran says and what the, the, the covenant itself speaks of. And they, they are those who stand firm in their testimonies. And then it says, And they are, they are those who guard their prayers. So before uh, going to the last verse, which is regarding once again the prayer, and we have seen this pattern emerge in the Quran that whenever something important is to be pointed out by the Quran, it is mentioned in the beginning and it is mentioned right at the end. So here clearly you can see this passage started off with the directive of the prayer and now it is also ending on this very directive. But before that, it says that these are people who stand firm in their testimonies. Which means that they are ones who testify, whenever they testify, they testify to the truth. Whenever they speak, they speak the truth. They abide by their testimonies. And even if that testimony might go against their own interest, it might go against the interest of their parents, as has been said elsewhere in the Quran, they still give uh, 
uh, what is the, the correct testimony, the right testimony, and in no way shirk this responsibility. And finally, as it says that وَلَّذِينَهُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِزُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ فِي جَنَّاتِ مُكْرَمُونَ that These people who have these qualities, uh, they are the ones who will be in gardens of paradise with great honor. So the Quran once again has made it clear that it is these traits which are essential that we must adhere to if we have to live or we have to end up in the life of paradise. And foremost among them is this directive of the prayer in which we have to uh, diligently and vigilantly adhere. So with this, we come to an end to this passage, this discussion on this passage. And now we can open the floor for any questions that might have been raised in our minds. Thank you, Dr. Shazad, for a wonderful lecture. We have just one raised hand right now. Ms. Naveed Irfan, you may go ahead. Yes, of course. If you have uh, accumulated wealth for, uh, for Hajj, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's something that you have to do. And if your Zakat date arrives, then you will pay Zakat on that. So remember the exemption in Zakat. If you have to, have to make this, uh, I mean, uh, this principle that has to be understood is that as far as exemptions in zakat are concerned, so items of personal use, they are exempted. Uh, any uh, any uh, nisab, which is which, which you, what, what is called as nisab, which means that if there is a certain statutory exemption beyond which uh, all the wealth or produce would be taxed, so that nisab is exempted. And the third exemption is regarding the means and tools of production. So, for example, if you are running a business or if you are owning a shop, then the items, the shop itself would be exempted. The factory itself would, would be exempted. So, means and tools of production would be exempted. So, these are the three exemptions uh, that uh, are there. Other than that, everything is zakatable. Yes, there could be this uh, situation in which uh, Islamic government gives relaxation on a particular area. For example, there are some countries... Uh, which give exemption on a widow's uh, taxation. For example, widows are exempted in certain countries from uh, paying the uh, tax or uh, from through the through the pension that they might be earning. Or and they, there are other heads as well. So, summing up, there are, these are the three uh, mandatory uh, exemptions which I just uh, mentioned. And fourthly, if a Muslim state uh, exempts a particular head in itself, then that would become exempt. Otherwise, everything would be zakatable. Well, I, I, I will have to listen to him and talk to him again on this subject because my understanding here is that it doesn't, I mean, as far as your personal items of use are concerned, they are exempted. Personal wealth is not exempted. You see, you, what you own as, an, as a, as a hard-earned object, I mean, it has to be a tangible object. It could be something that you are using for yourself. But something, uh, something of wealth that you have earned uh, or you have and you would like to spend it uh, for your own children's wedding, then uh, I don't see why it cannot be uh, zakatable. Thank you. Mashaba Vaseem, you can ask your question now. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just want to clear again that the Hajjat prayer, you said like we need to three raka uh, prayer. It's like odd number. So like we mm -hmm. have to a Maghrib kind of number uh, in a Tahajjat. The, like, I think the best way to understand the Tahajjat prayer is you just uh, see what the Witter prayer is. The Witter is in fact a Tahajjat prayer. It's just being offered with the Isha prayer as a concession. Otherwise, the Witter is in itself the Tahajjat prayer. And it has a minimum of three rakat. If you would like to add to it, then you can pray two nafils or four nafils or six in, uh, before those three three withers at night. So whatever uh, nafils that you pray, after that you can pray three withers or you can just offer three withers. So the minimum tahajjud prayer is just three withers and uh, maximum is that you can pray two rakats and then, of course, uh, pray these three withers. Okay, so the one time three with the, uh, three and then two is okay after then, which uh, which I, I mean, understand. As I said, the minimum the minimum is just three withers. If you do it, okay. your tahajjud is done. 
But uh-huh. if you want to offer more, then you first offer uh, two rakats, maybe two, and then offer three vitar. You can offer two and two, and then offer three. So you have to pray those vitars at the end. Before that, you can pray in groups of two, in two rakats, uh, any amount that you would like to. Uh-huh. So that's okay to in an even number to. So initially it will be an even, but later on when you'll offer three rakat uh, as vitar, I mean that will aut- automatically turn those even rakats into odd rakats. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Paran Nashur, you may have a question uh-huh. now. Sir, my question was about if we are talking about uh, to a potential spouse in the future, are we allowed to ask if they had any? previous sexual relationships uh, because they say you are not allowed to expose your own sins and you're not allowed to ask about the sins of, of others. So, but in order to know if this person is like a good spouse, you know, it's very uh, kind of important to know if mm-hmm. you understand. So are we, yes, allowed you can, or- uh, I mean, in, in a very polite and a very tasted way, you can ask this question if, if, the, if the girl or uh, I mean, if she's been involved in, in any intimate relation uh, with someone uh, prior, I mean, this is a right that you have to ask if you are considering that person to marry. And uh, I mean, the other person should also not take any offense about it. So this is something if you are really considering some someone very seriously, I think there's, uh, I mean, it is something that you can do. It's nothing wrong with it. Okay. And, but uh, they say you are, because you're not allowed to expose your own sense or the sense of others so i mean this is this is the general principle i mean this is a, but when you are getting married uh, then of course the matter is different so not exposing the sins of one's own self or others is a general principle which is true for many instances in which you would like to hide the sins of other people but this is not the same area i mean this is someone you are selecting as a spouse and therefore you would frankly like to know how the previous life of that person was and maybe that person, if uh, she admits that, yes, there was perhaps something that she would not uh, have, I mean, she's not very proud to share, but now she has mended her ways. So you see, this is all something that uh, can come to surface. That's not just the p- previous life in which she is going to expose herself. Uh, this could always be the fact that when once uh, she shares this, these details, she could also tell you that, well, she's given up on these things and now she's uh, totally a different person. So you see, if you if she shares these details with you, it will build confidence. And uh, likewise, I mean, she could ask the same questions from you as well. This is not a normal case. This is an exceptional case in which you are selecting a spouse. All right. Uh, Daniel, you may have a question now. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask what you just mentioned on, on zakat. Um, if you could elaborate on the situation for a widow. If a widow has essentially inherited or absorbed um, uh, a spouse's assets, um, who's who's obviously passed away, w- and and you know that and and the widow doesn't work, so the it's savings on which you get dividends and and maybe interest income. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. And second, like, what are the zakat implications on on that? Well, this is this is something. Uh, I mean, this would require a detailed answer, and I would suggest that because I have uh, already given a few lectures on this topic because there are heads in zakat, but what. What uh, I would say maybe before you uh, go on is that, I mean, exemptions have to be given by the government. In the absence of any such exemption, uh, z- yes, whatever her savings are, they would be zakatable. If she's earning income through various bonds or through various schemes, that also is zakatable. But as I said, the rates and the exemptions, they're all some, they require some detail. And I would uh, uh, ask our uh, course of this, uh, our uh, lady who's conducting Najia, she's here with us and she will be. Uh, she could share some of the links with you in which uh, you could see for yourself uh, some of the details. But up on the, the bottom line is that, yes, unless the government itself exempts someone, uh, everything that a person might be having in the form of wealth or produce or livestock is zakatable. You can see Nadia would like to ask the question. So, Nadia, would you like to unmute your mic? My name is Nadia and my name is Germany. मेरा क्वेश्चन है शायद आप मुझे एजुकेट कर सके इस बारे में कि पिछले दिनों मेरा जो थोड़ा सा रिलेशन डेवलप हुआ बोस्निया और युगोस्लाविया के मुसलमानों के साथ और उनकी जो यूथ जो है जो यहाँ जर्मनी में बड़ी हो रही है या पैदा हुई है और अब 18-19 इयर्स की है तो 
वो बॉयफ्रेंड और गर्लफ्रेंड का कॉन्सेप्ट खत्म करने के लिए या उसको रोकने के लिए उन्होंने मस्जिदों में निकाह शुरू किए हैं <coughs> मेरा सवाल ये है या आप शायद मुझे एजुकेट कर सके हैं कि क्या ये इस तरह से ठीक है क्योंकि जर्मन के कानून के मुताबिक ये रिकोगनाइज नहीं है और सबमिट नहीं करवा सकते जी और वो मिया बीवी वाले हकूक भी जो गवर्नमेंट देती है वो भी हासिल नहीं होते इंश्योरेंस भी वो वाली नहीं होती या जो यहाँ पे दूसरे आ, होते हैं अगर बच्चे पैदा हो जाते हैं तो फिर वो वाले हकूक हासिल नहीं होते क्योंकि निकाह तो उन्होंने मस्जिद में किया होता है जो यहाँ की जर्मन गवर्नमेंट के मुताबिक रिकोगनाइज नहीं होता वो तब तक रिकोगनाइज नहीं होता जब तक कि वो ऑफिशियली उसको दोबारा से गवर्नमेंट के तरीके के मुताबिक निकाह ना करें थे so i so think uh, since, educate kare ji ji i understand what yes. your question is you see when you are conducting a nikah nikah is a public uh, i mean something which has to be declared in the public and it has to be according to the law of the land that you are living in so it's not uh, sufficient that you just conduct that nikah in the mosque because as you said yourself the government does not recognize it and as a result they would not register it they would not grant rights uh, to the spouses and they would also not recognize them as husband and wife so uh, uh, so it is essential that when muslims they marry there they should go through the legal procedure which the german government has laid down so if they want to get married then they must uh, adopt the right path which is that of course they would sh- should go to that office in in germany wherever uh, these uh, marriages are registered and this would also entail rights and responsibilities uh, i would not condone i would not go along with this that uh, uh, for the sake of uh, ease uh boys and girls they just conduct nikah in the mosque and then uh, without any uh, without being given any rights because you see this would this would also cause a lot of dispute for example if one of uh, if the husband divorces the wife for, for any reason then how is the wife going to appeal for that or maybe uh, appeal for some of her rights that uh, a court may grant so it would become something which is which would be very uh, I mean produce oppression for for women as well similarly if the children are born how would they uh, how would they be looked upon uh, in the government i mean in the state that you are living in whether they are legal citizens or not so these all these issues would become very important so i would say that i, I would not go along with this practice that uh, boy, boys and girls should just because they would like to avoid that uh, awkward situation to just get married in the mosque i think they should proper the follow the proper procedure which is laid down by the german government because this is the right way to go about, go about it थैंक यू वेरी मच मेरा भी पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू यही था कि लीगल इशूज के मुतालिक फिर क्या होगा और ये इस वक्त बहुत ज्यादा यूथ में यहाँ जर्मनी में मैं देख रही हूँ खासतौर पर जो युगोस्लाविया बोस्निया और इस तरफ के मुसलमान हैं उनमें ये बहुत ज्यादा पकड़ा जा रहा है अगर जो फैमिलीज भी इन्वॉल्व होती हैं वो भी साथ करती हैं लेकिन वो बात ठीक है कि फिर जब बच्चे होंगे तलाक होगी या फिर जायदाद के क्या हकूक होंगे वो थैंक यू वेरी मच बहुत शुक्रिया ये मैंने आपसे एजुकेट थैंक यू थैंक यू दानियाल यू मे आस्क द क्वेश्चन कैन यू क्लेरिफाई द कांसेप्ट ऑफ कजा सलात सो यू सी एज फार एज द कजा सलात इज कंसर्न आई यू रेफरिंग टू द फैक्ट दैट द द प्रेयर्स दैट यू हैव मिस्ड फॉर अ गुड नंबर ऑफ इयर्स और यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट अ सलात व्हिच यू माइट हैव मिस्ड ड्यूरिंग द डे आई आई गेस बोथ इफ यू कैन क्लेरिफाई मे बी बोथ Please. so as far as the prayer which is missed uh, due to some reason uh, in any part of the day is concerned you should make it uh, make up for it as soon as possible and uh, this is uh, this is like a, a debt that you have and we have to repay that debt as soon as possible so before going to sleep that day it is uh, it is good that you just uh, make up for the missed prayers and uh, secondly as far as uh, a number of prayers that my, a person might have missed because of uh, maybe uh, turning to god was something which uh, came up to that person in a later part of his life then you see there are three uh, because there is nothing from the prophet in this regard the prophet has not given us any directive nor the quran regarding uh, missed prayers uh, for for a better part of our life so our jurists have uh, come up with three solutions or the three, there are three categories 
So one is that if the prayers are, I mean, uh, the, one section says, I mean, one group of scholars say that uh, you just need to do Tawba and repent before the Almighty and just start uh, whenever, whenever you realize and you just uh, be punctual after that. Uh, another group says that uh, what you can do is that the uh, besides the mandatory prayer, whatever other rakahs that you're offering, just make this intention in your mind whenever you stand up to pray those rakahs that, well, God, please count these amongst, amongst my missed prayers. And the third group is rather more stringent and it says that, well, you have to calculate each and every uh, prayer that you missed to the best of your estimation and then start offering it uh, one by one. So my own understanding here would be that uh, if the best is to me is the second one, the second, uh, the second category of people who say that uh, if the number of prayers missed is a lot and of course it cannot be compensated, then uh, I mean, it could be a mixture of the first and suicide categories. The, the ones that cannot be compensated uh, because of their sheer number, they should be, I mean, we should seek repentance for them uh, before the Almighty and others that we can, we should make them up by actually making this intention for our nafil prayers or the sunnah prayers that well these are the pray these are the obligatory prayers that we missed in our previous life and may god count them amongst those prayers and and when you are praying kaza prayer for something you missed during the day do you just pray that prayer normally like once you pray yes you that pray it normally yep just the first part you just need to pray the mandatory rakats just pray it normally thank you thank you nashaba wasim you may ask your question. Sir, if we invest in a stocks or in a bond, so they the return will be uh, up and down like that. It's not fixed, but you do not get the mm -hmm. loss. So is it uh, okay to uh, invest that kind of uh, uh, or not? Well, it depends. I mean, stocks are perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with stocks. As far as bonds are concerned, it depends which bonds uh, are we talking about. These security bonds, they are these welfare bonds. It's the government issues, and in most cases, the government themselves tell us that they are based on interest. So, I mean, we should avoid taking interest, I would say, uh, unless the specification is that these are not interest-bearing bonds and uh, they are giving you profit, in which case, of, of course, if you study the mechanism, uh, I mean, in most cases, what they say is profit is also interest uh, in its essence. So, unless you're really pushed um, and, I mean, you're in a situation that there is no alternative, I think this is something that we should avoid as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in these countries, there are word interest. There is no word of profit. There is no know? profit. Yeah. This is always interest based. Yeah. Interest based. Yeah. And if the interest even fluctuates, uh, that's not halal. Uh, that doesn't matter because, see, interest itself is something that you should not consume. Uh -huh. And uh, I have one more question. I'm reading Quran, and there are some uh, commandments which Allah mentioned. Be, uh, allow before and then uh, they said it's not allowed for example the mm -hmm. will like uh, it say like before you die you can write down your will mm -hmm. and then uh, right. why it happened uh, nah, these things so you, so, so you see earlier on uh, uh, we know that uh, this uh, inheritance laws they were, they were, they were given gradually earlier on uh, the muslims were told that uh, they should just make a will and and whatever the conventions and the customs of the society are, they can write a will in favor of their parents and their uh, next in kin. But uh, after a while, when Muslims were, I mean, uh, deeply ingrained in, in Islam and they realized and understood what it, uh, what it actually stood for, then this whole uh, law of inheritance was revealed. So this uh, law of inheritance was given uh, after some time. And uh, uh, before the law itself was was revealed, we were told that we could write down our own will according to the maruf and conventions of the society. Mm -hmm. So same with the fasting. So why it's changing? Yes, even the because you see, again, the fasting in, in that too, people were not used to fast in other parts of the year. And so they were given this option that either they fast in other parts of the year if, or they could uh, give fidya in case they were traveling or they were on a journey. So later on, this was in, uh, revoked and it's, uh, and the Quran said that once people have gotten used to fast in other parts of the year as well. So instead of now just paying fidya or, uh, or, or fasting, whatever the option is, now they must fast in other times of the year. You see, the sharia given to human beings, they, it caters for their 
general development it caters for they are generally used to and it slowly and surely brings them uh, to the ultimate uh, thing which the, or the optimum thing which god wants them to do mm -hmm. so i think in, uh, we can get it like if a new person enter in islam and if the child is praying so if uh, initially he just pray one time so i think it's okay and then gradually i mean uh, this is something this is this is the the hikma or the way that you could call people to in which uh, i mean it teaches us this lesson that when people are uh, new to religion then you sh should slowly and gradually bring them to its uh, all its its directives and before that happens give them some more time mm -hmm. okay thank you sir thanks thank you so much arushizad for a wonderful lecture and all the answers to our questions